So good morning. I know there was a party last night, so thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Roberto Bamberger. I'm a senior principal consultant with the Microsoft Incident Response Team. So, you know, we are the customer-facing arm of Microsoft when customers are having, when organizations are having security events. Um, so, we show up on people's worst days. Uh, my colleague, uh, Thomas Wulstick, will be actually doing the majority of the presentation. I'm going to give you some background on this. Um, so, Thomas didn't know that I volunteered him to do this. We got the call for, pay, call for presentations, and I said, you know, we did some interesting stuff that we haven't been able to talk about anywhere. I'm just going to go ahead and submit a session. And I put Thomas's name on it without telling him. I'm the senior guy. I can do that. Okay. Um, and you know, then then I saw that when we submitted the presentation abstract, it actually sent him an email. So I was like, oh, I better tell him what's going on. I was like, hey, don't worry. You know, it's only got like a 10% chance of getting accepted. Well, it got accepted. Uh, but so. And then Thomas is like, but I really don't like public speaking. Do I have to do this? And it's like, yeah, it's a good growth opportunity. Isn't that what a manager would say? I'm not a manager, but isn't that what you would say, right? It's like, yeah, it'll, it'll be good for you to stretch and show. So anyhow, Thomas is here. Um, he's going to take you through kind of the technical aspects of this. But the backstory on this is kind of fun and interesting. We were working on an investigation into a threat actor that we don't know who it is, other than they're probably based in China. They're probably doing something that aligns with that country's national interests. We don't know if it's truly nation state sponsored or a volunteer or just a researcher. And we dialed into some of this threat actor's infrastructure and we started analyzing it. And we saw that they were you know, targeting multiple organizations and they'd compromise one organization, but the authentication patterns looked really weird. That's a technical term, right? And so we actually went out and did what we call a nation state notification. Our partners in the Microsoft Threat Intel Center, they're the ones that do attribution. We have a program that's blessed by our corporate and legal affairs team called nation state notifications. So we went and actually did a notification to this victim organization. You know how Microsoft always tells you, hey, Microsoft people will never call you to tell you you're having a security event? Unless we do. Um, we actually will contact organizations. We do it in a very systematic fashion. We work with whoever the local account team is that works with that customer, so it's not a cold call. Every once in a while we do do cold calls. But anyhow, so we get in contact with this customer and we say, hey, we're seeing something really weird. We think you've been compromised. We think it's been going on for a while. And they're like, wow, thank you. Let us go take a look at it. A um, couple of days later, you know, we set up a signal chat with them. They're coming back, hey, can you tell us more about this? We get back on the phone with them. Hey, our, our insurance company would like to understand what's really going on. My CISO, my CEO wants you to brief us on this. So we do all of this. and. You know, we never do this. We're not chasing ambulances. We're really just here to help our customers. And they said, well, yep, great. You know, we know we have a problem. It's a nonprofit organization that um, focuses on, you know, things like election security and totalitarian regimes. So uh, nonprofit organization, you know, so they're trying to defend against nation state adversaries on a nonprofit budget, right? So feel bad for the guys. And they're like, well, you know, thank you for all this information. We're like, hey, we're here to help. We actually do do incident response if you want our help. You know, great. We tell them everything that we know about it. And then they um, talk to their insurance provider, and their insurance provider brings in Mandiant. So I'm part of the Mandiant business development arm is one of the things I do. That's a joke. Um, but we were actually really happy to be able to partner with folks from Mandiant that did do the investigation with this customer. And as the title says, the threat actor had compromised the customer's environment, stolen some authentication material, some credential material, and was abusing seamless single sign-on. Never seen this before in the wild. It's a technique that's well-documented 
by people like um, Nestori Simonyi and Dirk Jean Molina. So the guys behind AAD internals tools and Road Recon. Um, and of course, they've collaborated with our friend uh, Benjamin Delpy, who's incorporated some of this into Mimikatz for us, or for attackers, yeah. or, or I'm sorry, security researchers, right? Um, and I thought that was a really cool thing, but we didn't get to do the investigation, so I didn't really have very much data. Well, we submitted the paper anyway, because I figured, you know, I'd reached out to Thomas, who'd worked with me on another engagement previously, and I was like, hey, this guy knows how to set up a test lab, and he knows how to play with all of our data. It's like, hey, can you tell me, hey, is this an artifact from this tool or that tool? And you're know, like, a day later, he's done like this amazing work, which he'll show you a little bit of. And, um, you know, so we had a test lab where we could simulate all this. That's cool. So, okay, I'll submit the, the paper, great. So fast forward, now we're in July. And Thomas, who actually reads details like the fact that we were most, supposed to submit the slides at the beginning of August, and he was on vacation for August, is like, hey, we gotta go get this done. Meanwhile, we get pulled in to another investigation, same threat actor, and he's trying to create this presentation, which he didn't know he was doing, but I forced him to do it. And we're just blindly hunting across Microsoft's global telemetry. And he's like, um, oh, there's another victim. And it's this company over here. I said, well, that's interesting, because in, I stumbled across that same victim organization in this other investigation to the same threat actor. So luckily for us, the threat actor decided in July to go use the exact same technique against another victim. So we're gonna tell you a little bit about the backstory of this, and more importantly, how you can look in customer's telemetry or your telemetry to see if you're falling victim to this, and a couple of the things that you can do to better protect yourself so that you don't fall victim to this particular technique. All right, and I'll be here after, you know, for questions and answers too, but I'm gonna hand it off to Thomas, who's gonna do all the hard work. Thank you, Roberto. Um, so let's get started. So the idea of the session for today is like, we will shortly introduce what is Seamless SSO, so that we know like how organizations are using it. We will talk a little bit about like how can threat actors abuse it. It's already well documented online, but still to set the scene. But the main focus of what I would like to share today is the detection part, like the methodology to hunt for this abuse in your organization. And I think there's even like a few key takeaways here for how you can hunt for other abuse as well, right? So it's more like a methodology sharing that I would like to do. And we will round up with like a part of protecting against it. Like how can you make sure this doesn't happen to you, right? So what is seamless SSO? As you all might know, a lot of applications like Office and Azure, and Azure, they rely on an authentication provider like Azure Active Directory. Azure Active Directory relies on users and a common way to get users into Azure Active Directory is to synchronize them using Azure AD Connect or Azure AD Cloud Sync. That gives you like a duplicate duplication of the identities, but still they require a password. And a lot of customers rely on password hash synchronization for that. So the passwords are in sync, right? So nothing special there. That does mean though, if an employee is entering the office in the morning and they go through their contra athlete experience to log on to their workstation, they have to provide their password, right? When they access something like Office in, in the web browser, they might be prompted again to access their pa to enter their password, right? And so this feature was um, brought to you by the Azure Active Directory team as a way to lower user friction and to lower the amount of times users have to enter their password, right? So that's where this feature comes into play. It's something optional. And in order for, for an organization to use it, there are a few prerequisites, right? So for starters, it only will affect or benefit users that are synchronized. They have to be living in Active Directory and synchronized to Azure Active Directory. For cloud users, there's no, no kind of benefit or, or um, they can't use it. When the user wants to use the feature or benefit from the feature, they should be doing this from a domain joint machine, which has a direct line of sight with a domain controller, which means they can do like 
Kerberos authentication over the various TCP IP ports that the, that the firewall would allow, right? So they need to be inside the corporate network. And last but not least, the IT administrator of your organization needs to configure the browser on the workstation to do to trust the Kerberos authentication endpoint in the cloud. Typically, this is drawn to group policy or another client configuration method that has like one specific URL the administrator has to mark as being part of the local internet zone, which will help this feature work end-to-end. -end. But we will go into a little bit more detail in the next slides. Now, how can Azure Active Directory trust something that some on-premise domain controller gives to it to validate the user? Like, there must be some level of trust configured, right? And there is. As soon as the IT administrator configures this feature using the Azure Deconnect wizard, as part of that configuration step, a virtual computer account is created in Active Directory in the on-premise network, right? With a password, a secret, that is also configured or, or, or safely stored in Azure Active Directory. And that will be like a key element of how the trust is established between that specific on-premises on directory and Azure Active Directory. How does the happy path work? Like the happy path is like a user using this, right? So the user is trying to access an application like portal.office.com and portal.office.com has basically no way of validating credentials. All it knows is I need to redirect the user to Azure Active Directory, who's my identity provider, and this instance knows how to do authentication. So the only thing the user needs to do, and we're at step two right now, is provide a username, like type the username. Sometimes the username might all be already be remembered from a previous session, but as soon as the user provides their username to Azure Active Directory, Azure Active Directory can look up the user, look up the tenant, look up what is expected from configuration. And in this case, Azure Active Directory will challenge the browser for a Kerberos token, right? And a browser on a domain joint machine has been doing this for years. Kerberos is baked in, in, the, in the system. This is nothing new. The browser will contact the Active Directory domain controller because it has a line of sight with a domain controller and will ask for a Kerberos ticket for the user based on the virtual computer account that the wizard created. Active Directory knows how to issue Kerberos tickets. The user gets their Kerberos ticket. And this is where the additional configuration was required, right? Because under normal circumstances, a browser would not be giving tokens or Kerberos tickets to something on the internet. That's why we needed to configure the local internet zone to trust this thing on the internet so that the browser would send off the Kerberos token to the Azure Active Directory authentication endpoint. And this is where in step eight, where we have like the, the little arrow in the cloud, Azure Active Directory can actually verify that this ticket was issued by the Active Directory it's expecting it from because it was protected by the same secret, they, the secret they both share, right? So they can validate the identity. And so Azure Active Directory is satisfied and in exchange for the Kerberos ticket, it will provide a regular access token like you would have had with a normal authentication or with a federated authentication, a normal access token, which the user will receive and eventually provide to the application. Right. So this is the happy part. This is how users would use it. I know there's like a lot of arrows on this diagram, but for an end user, it's basically like they go to the application, they click on their username, and they end up back on the application. Like there's nothing more for them to do. Their browser might flicker a little bit, but it's a convenience feature, like no additional complexity. So we have seen now what users can get from it. What do attackers get from it? Like, why would they want to abuse it, right? So for an attacker, this is quite interestingly, because if they can abuse it in the way which we will describe, they can impersonate any synchronized user. Right? That's like, they can say like, I want to be you, I want to be you, I want to be you. They just say who they want to be. There are some prerequisites for this though. So for starters, the feature needs to be configured by the IT administrator, which is kind of a, a given. They need to know the SID of the user they are trying to impersonate, which is the Active Directory security identifier. It's like a unique identifier stored in Active Directory. It's not a big secret, right? There's plenty of ways to get it. Uh, it's, it's just an identifier. The third one is really important though. That one with the ex exclamation mark. 
the threat actor needs to have the hashes of the virtual computer account that is basically the shared secret. And this is not like a small deal, right? This is a very big deal because this basically means that your Active Directory environment is compromised. The threat actor is either like a domain admin or was capable of getting the Active Directory database, the engineers that did, so this is a very big deal already. But depending on what the threat actor wants to achieve with the compromise, this might be their, their happy day, right? If they want to deploy ransomware, they, they likely have already all the keys that they need to do that. If they want to listen in on your communications in Office 365, this is where it starts for them. So they need to, don't need to blow this kind of access. They can just go silently and abuse this to impersonate anybody for as long as they want, right? So that's why, yes, it's a big deal, this kind of compromise, but still it might get worse, right? And last but not least, they need some kind of a tool to craft these Kerberos tokens in such a way that Azure Active Directory can consume them. But as Roberto introduced, there are various security researchers that have built these tools, both to know the weaknesses and to understand and not only to facilitate attackers, but I would say to educate the security community. And so the first one we can use for this, for example, is the one from Nestori. It's the AID internals toolkit, right? As you can see on the, the first highlighted line, the only thing the attacker needs is the SID of the user and the hashes, right? Which will be converted into the dollar token, which is, or the dollar Kerberos, which is a Kerberos ticket. And this is something that can happen offline, right? So that's important to understand. While I said that the happy part required the user to be able to talk to the domain controller, in this step, there's no more domain control, right? This is the domain control. So this could happen on a computer in your network or on infrastructure that the threat actor is doing their work on, right? Eventually, this Kerberos ticket is provided to Azure Active Directory, and Azure Active Directory will give you an access token as if you were like a legit legitimate user using the AID PowerShell tools, right? And you can interact with, with Azure Active Directory or other applications with the privileges the user you're impersonating has. A second example, and the reason I'm bringing two examples to demonstrate the same attack is because depending on the tools used further down the line, we might, we might have other forensic artifacts. Because one of the capabilities that Mimikatz has, for example, it will generate a Kerberos token just as fine, but it will install it in the user session of the threat actor's machine. Similarly, like a user would go to like the happy part where the browser does the same thing. It takes it from the uh, OS, and this will result in slightly different change uh, artifacts uh, later down. Okay, so this is where we actually, like if we would use something like KList, which allows us to list Kerberos tickets from the operating system, we would actually see the ticket that was generated by Mimikatz. And so the browser just consumes this ticket and uses it, right? No magic, like no fancy editing cookies or injecting stuff. No, it just uses the, the, the token or the ticket as if it were be the happy part. So now I would say we get to the, I think the, the part I'm really passionate about, how can we detect this kind of stuff, this kind of badness? And I think the first important thing is like the distinction between sign interactive sign-in events and non-interactive sign-in events. Most of the time when you're hunting for identity-related events, I would say it starts with an interactive sign-in. Like a user going through uh, the experience of providing their username, password, multi-factor, it's an interactive sign-in. However, once a user starts working with their a system, a lot of ex tokens are being exchanged all the time. Like that's not always an explicit or interactive sign-in. On very, on a lot of situations, a user is going to a new application, like for example, from webmail to SharePoint, and under the covers, tokens are being exchanged. These are non-interactive. So the thing to understand here is like, when a user is exchanging the Kerberos ticket for an access token, it's a non-interactive sign-in. Right? So it means if you're hunting through your sign-in events for suspicious stuff, you might be kind of missing it. Because in a lot of places, the way these logs work, they are either exposed together or one is exposed, or you don't always have hands on the full set of events. And I would say likely the, the reason for that is like the non-interactive sign-in events can be very verbose, which 
could mean a big data volume, right? One of the easier things you can use to spot some abuse, but this is definitely not airtight. When somebody is using, for example, AAD internals in a non-modified way, there's kind of, a, kind of a giveaway. The user agent will have a hint that Windows PowerShell is being used. But of course, as most people know, user agents are just a hint of what the, the client is using, and often these can be modified. But this is already like a difference with the Mimikatz approach and the AD internals approach, because Mimikatz is just using a browser on the system. It will just be a browser user agent, right, without even having to, to change it. But this could be a quick win, because you all know that threat actors from time to time, they are lazy, or they are testing, or they are evolving, and they might leave traces like this behind, right? So this is, I would say, a quick win. The biggest complexity when working with sign-in events and finding bad stuff is like, you have like thousands, 100,000, a million events, you cannot start doomsday scrolling, right? You cannot just scroll and hope to find the bad events. So with the understanding of how this works, like we explained the happy part, we know that this feature normally should be used by a user from a corporate machine talking to a corporate domain controller, and then commonly they would egress from the corporate company public IPs. So technically that pool of IPs should be finite and known to you, and technically you could ask all the sign-in events, filter the ones that you know are legitimate, and you should possibly have only the bad ones leaving out of, uh, uh, out of the equation, right? Um, that's the theory. However, remember, the threat actor stole the secrets of your kingdom in your network. So there is a chance they are doing this from inside your network. That's one step, right? So it's not always conclusive. And second, depending on how you allow your remote work first to operate from home, they might be opening a VPN tunnel with a split tunnel concept, which allows them to communicate with Active Directory, but at the same time, they might egress from their home IPs to the internet. So this kind of logic is not airtight, but I think that's the thing with threat hunting, right? It's not always airtight. It, it's small pieces that help you. And so there's an additional artifact that I would say that's really useful when trying to zoom in on these events. Um, because the complexity is like non-interactive sign-in events, there are many of those. And there's one uh, field that Azure Active Directory logs, and basically it gives you a clue about which endpoint processed the authentication. Like Azure ID is built as a service, there's different endpoints responsible for different aspects. And so we know Kerberos authentications are processed by the Windows authentication controller endpoint. And actually there's different sub endpoints that we can identify. So for example, when a user is logging onto their Windows machine, going to the control lead experience, that will actually trigger a Windows transport call in the logs. If they're using their browser for the happy part, it will be an SSO call. If we see AAD internals doing its magic, it will be a Windows transport call. And that's just due to the fact how the author of AAD internals decided to interact with the services and the endpoints, like how he shows like his happy path to success. And for example, uh, CloudSync uses a username user mix just to show you there are other values that might legitimately appear there. And so this is again or another way of approaching the problem, right? If we know that under normal circumstances, user control delete and use their browser, we should typically have events with Windows transport and SSO calls, like IPs should have both. Whereas if we only see SSO calls, it might be an indication of like the Mimikatz spot, or if we only have an IP with Windows transport calls, it might be an indication of a, a deep uh, internal usage, right? So if we bring all of this together, and as an example, we have like an advanced hunting query here, which people can use through the Defender uh, security portal, the language itself is KUSTO, KQL. It's what we use across, across many of our security products and, and as an incident response team, we use it to hunt through customer data as well when, when we collect data. Um, this particular source is from the AAD Sun and Events beta table, which is a table that um, you, you do require Enter ID P2 licenses for it, right? But it's part of Defender. 
And so what I want to show you here is like how you can start from like 30 days of events, 30 days worth of events. We zoom in only on the ones having the endpoint call transport or SSO, but still we will have a lot of events, right? Because your end users are using this from day to day. And so what we will do is we will summarize all these events so that for every row in our data set, we have a single IP, right? So we want to know what distinct IPs are observed here. But of course, just having a list of IPs is very basic. So we do something I think which is really interesting in, in hunting in general. For every IP, we will look what is the first event we observed and what is the last event we observed, right? Because we can kind of assume if the, under normal circumstances, your company IPs, they will be there from day one till day 30. Maybe in the weekends there will be, will be no events possibly, but they should consistently appear. Whereas a threat actor, depending on how long they are in the environment, of course, might only be like the last 20 days or, or, or a window of 10 days, like they might come in and go out and you, will, you possibly might see a difference there, right? So going from like millions of events to like a handful of events is really powerful. What else we are trying to do, like we have a small screenshot of the table on the, on the, on the slides, is basically trying to provide you like a scoring card of confidence, right? So what the query does as well, it will count the unique user principal names of the observed in the events, right? If your company has 2,000 employees and you get like 1,000, 1,500 UPNs in there, you kind of can assume again that this is legitimate, right? Traditionally or typically a threat actor would not be impersonating all of those. So that's again how you can try to hide uh, the good stuff from the bad stuff. Same for the user agent strings, right? We will count the number of unique user agent strings observed. And we even have a special case there. We do a make set, so like we will give you back the user agents we see, but we only care about the first five. Right? If in a typical user scenario, there might be hundreds or 200 user agents, we don't care about all those. But if it's a small number, we might want to see what user agents are there because that we can, as a human, we can process. There's no point in scrolling through 200 user agents, right? But if there's five user agents and it has like a Python or a PowerShell or something that gives the threat actor away, it might be really useful to do so. And so in this example, which is, it was part of my lab, I would say the, the first record is like the happy path, right? It's the users using the feature. We see my company IP, which ends in .66. We see a number of transport count calls, a number of SSO count calls, uh, and we can kind of assume that that is the legitimate user, right? And the next line, we only have SSO calls, right? So we could, or it could possibly be that the threat actor is using the Mimikatz approach from this IP, right? Of course, there's always edge scenarios and there's, this is never exact science, but if you have it as an IP and you look it up and it's suspicious for other reasons, like due to the country it's in or it's a hosting provider, that might be added weight to your decision whether you want to pursue this or whether you want to ring some alarm bells, right? And same for the last record. Uh, this one is an example where we only have transport calls, which is an indicator for the AAD internals being used. Right. Correct. In the last call, we also have the PowerShell user agent, right? So this is what I think is like the, the hidden ingredient of a lot of our jobs, right? You have a lot of data and you try to visualize it, visualize it in such a way that you see the anomalies, right? So yeah. we have been talking a little bit about like non-interactive versus interactive sign-in logs and that they are not exposed everywhere. So this is what I want to like transparently explain here. For example, to start at the bottom one, the unified audit log is really powerful as a log because it allows you to uh, hunt through audit events which, has a, which cover Office, for example, emails item accessed, inbox rules created, files from SharePoint downloaded. So it's really powerful and I would say like having these operations without sign-in events would be really mean, not meaningless, but it would, be, it would be hard to hunt through. However, I would assume due to the data volume, these logs don't have the non-interactive sign-in events, right? So that's what I tried to explain here with this slide. It's important to know if you're hunting for something 
where should I go look, right? I would say the best place that, uh, that you have the full experience in this, for this particular scenario is the Edison in events beta. However, you can also draw it to the Azure Edison inlogs which you can export to Custo or another solution. Uh, but for in that situation, you will not have access to the endpoint call. Right. So this concludes like the detection part, right? I hope I was able to share like a bit of the methodology and a bit of the details how you can use this to, to hunt in your own organization. In conclusion, we would also like to explain how can you protect from this, right? How can you prevent this? Um, so one of the recommendations is, in order for this to happen, a threat actor needs to have access to the secrets of the virtual computer accounts, right? And where are the secrets? They are in Active Directory. What do you normally do with secrets? You try to protect them, right? So this is like the key message for preventing this attack is, I would say, don't be worried about this particular attack. Try to be concerned about your Active Directory environment, right? Do you have proper controls in place? Do you have monitoring in place? And more importantly, do you treat Active Directory as a tier zero asset? Right. That, I think that's the key thing here, right? Um, a second important thing, even if Active Directory get compromised, it's less related to this particular attack, but still it's a very important element that we want to bring it here, is like make sure your users in Active Directory don't have privileges in your cloud, right? Because often we see on-premises users getting fished or their credentials leaking, and it makes it all too easy for the threat actor to transition into the cloud, right? So keep the administration separate. And something extremely important, uh, because some of you might already have have had their, this idea in their head, like what, what I'm explaining here awful sounds a lot like a golden summer attack, right? <coughs> like threat actor steals a secret, threat actor becomes anybody they want, right? It's like a golden summer attack, right? The key difference there, I would say luckily, with the golden summer attack, the threat actor can craft the claims and can kind of suggest that they are inside the network or that multi-factor authentication is applied. So a golden summer attack is nasty, for sure. With this approach, the threat actor can impersonate anybody they want using by crafting a Kerberos token, but they have no impact or they cannot suggest to Azure Active Directory that, hey, it's okay, we did MFA. That means if a threat actor is trying to exchange a Kerberos token for an access token, and there is a conditional access policy requiring multi-factor, that the threat actor will hit a wall, right? So as many people during the conference have said, multi-factor authentication, it's important. Make sure you have it. Maybe like another thing to add here. As a security team, you can also make small operational errors which have big consequences. Specific to conditional access, Often companies define a set of public IPs which are their internal ranges, allowing internal employees to have a lower friction to just access resources without having to apply MFA. However, when defining those ranges, make sure to have your subnet mask correct. Right? We have seen a situation where the IT team of the customer, they had like a slash 16 instead of like a slash 32 or a slash whatever, smaller. And the dead actor was really clever. He said like, let's see if there's a virtual provider that is in the same range. And so the dead actor was able to impersonate whomever, whenever from their own happy virtual machine outside of the company network. Yeah. I always tell people, you know, if there's one thing that you can do, well, I'll give you two to better protect yourself and protect your cloud environment. The first one is, um, as Thomas just pointed out, let's keep administrative accounts, highly privileged accounts, to the domain that they administer, right? So I can protect my cloud from, my, from an on-prem breach and my 
on-prem from a cloud breach, right? I'm never going to lose positive administrative control, right? Because I'm keeping those 100% separate. The second thing is most customers that we work with, oh, yes, we require multi-factor authentication. And please complete this sentence for me unless... Unless you're on my corporate network, right? I like to recommend to people, just like, I guess it was, a, an, is it Emmys? No. Academy Award winning movie, everything, everywhere, all at once. That should be your MFA policy. And like we heard yesterday during one of the keynotes from the, from the CISO of Coinbase, right? Not all MFA is created equal, right? And now we have threat actors that are very good at social engineering their way into satisfying MFA, right? Um, so hardware-based MFA, if at all possible, especially for your privileged accounts and for your high-value assets. But we did see, you know, in victim one, so this technique, the Azure AD SSO technique, it doesn't satisfy MFA. It basically just gets you, hey, I am this user, right? Presents a token saying, I am this user. If your conditional access policies will still apply, and you're going to, you know, if you require MFA, it's still going to challenge the user for that. So it's one more hurdle that the threat actor has to clear, right? The, but, you know, the second piece of this is just really understanding, you know, what your environment looks like and how it works. If you do that, then you'll know what you have to protect for. But I think the key thing that we wanted to share was that you can look at your sign-in telemetry, right? And we do this at scale. We can go look at anonymized data across any token that is received or issued by Azure Active Directory. And now we have an ability, based on Thomas's excellent work here, to go detect potential abuse of Azure AD single sign-on and help protect our customers. So that's one of the things we're really super excited by. This was the last slide, right? Almost? Almost. Oh, okay. yeah, but yeah, we're almost there, right? So that's really good. Oh, so, there we go, yeah. Importantly, like from an operational point of view, it's a secret, and the general recommendation is to rotate the secret every 30 days. Right? Because in the case a secret got leaked, that would reduce the validity of the, or the window of the attack, right? And if you are in a situation where your Active Directory is compromised, or you suspect it being compromised, you might have a recovery playbook where, for example, you roll the K or BTGT secret twice, do the same with this one. It'll have the same effect, right? The threat actor will no longer be, will be able to craft Kerberos tickets, but Azure AD will say, like, I don't know that secret, so roll twice, right? Almost nobody does this. Almost nobody is keeping this thing updated every 30 days is the first thing. Um, it's not automatic in the platform is why. You have to go in and manually do it. So if you're going to use Azure AD single sign-on, definitely... You know, set a reminder for your system administrators, set a re recurring task to have them go renew it. The reason you have to uh, roll it twice is once you roll it, you know, we know that, um, you know, you can have propagation delays on credentials across Active Directory, so we don't want to have a disruption in service. So Azure AD stores two copies, the last two copies of that uh, Kerber, uh, Kerberos, decry Kerberos decryption ticket, right? Um, or decryption key, I guess, yeah. Key secret. <laughs> key secret. It, it sort of two copies of it, so you have to invalidate both of the ones that the threat actor might have had access to. Now we're done. Yeah. So, yeah. key takeaways when you're hunting for this, make sure you understand in which kind of area to look, right, in the right log places. Mm -hmm. Use every, everything that you can find, like IP, user agent, if you have endpoint call, use endpoint call. Make sure, like, don't get, get carried away with this novel technique. Just do the basics. Protect your Active Directory, right? Yeah. Leverage multi-factor authentication. And operationally, make sure to not lose track of this secret, right? Roll it regularly, right? Have, like Roberto said, have a, a calendar item in your, like, you check your backups, 
you check your secrets, right? Mm -hmm. Have a calendar item in your operational team. So I also want to like provide a few links, but more for offline consumption, right? A lot of this work was definitely not possible with the work for other security researcher sharing in the community, educating. So I do want to like uh, highlight these people that are really useful for us doing similar work, right? And last but not least, if you want to know more about some of the logs referenced, we have some more pointers here. Mm -hmm. And with that, I would like to thank you. Open up for possible yeah. questions. He did all the work, so ask him all the tough questions. I'll make the sarcastic comments. Any questions? So uh, the question was, they disable synchronization of accounts from, at, from Active Directory to Azure AD. Is that correct? So oh, so you're, you're not allowing uh, password write back, right? OK. There's a lot of ways to protect your cloud from your on-prem and your on-prem from your cloud, right? You get to make the risk decisions. And what we're constantly battling is, you know, ease of use and usability, you know, so convenience for your end users and security. Um, in general, if you put too many hurdles in front of your end users, you know, too many security controls in front of them to be productive, that's usually what gives birth to shadow IT. So I would rather have them have a slightly, this is a personal opinion, I would rather have my customers maybe have a slightly lower security posture, but keep them in my environment so I can monitor and everything else. But in general, so whether you're going to enable password write back, yeah, that does change the equation. If I can compromise your cloud identity, you know, fish you, password spray you, everything else, and then the threat actor can't just go and um, you know change the password for the user. That's good, but it really, you're asking me a question about what controls do I have on credential resets, right? Who can do them? Where can they do them from? And if you're going to do that, then you can also say, well, what controls do I have around things like multi-factor authentication and device registration? So in a lot of the cases, um, yesterday they talked quite a bit about this threat actor that's really annoying all of us uh, that we call scattered spider because they're really good at social engineering. And they're really good at tricking help desks into like changing um, you know, credentials and things like that for people or adding a new multi-factor authentication device. So we've actually worked with customers that were getting so impacted by this threat actor that they had to go change their process for password changes or password resets. Um, it wasn't you just could call up the help desk. They actually needed written approval from a vice president level. And to, you know, they did just like the, the team at Coinbase. They went and they, they issued hardware tokens for all users for MFA. Um, one of my customers actually required people to physically come into one of their facilities to change their credentials and to re-register their multi-factor devices. To, and that kind of broke the back of that threat actor. So it really is you know, your, your risk tolerance. Um, you can use password write back extremely securely and it doesn't increase your risk. But usually the better idea is let's actually restrict that password write back for coming from you know, a trusted location, and I told you I don't like trusted locations, or from, you know, a, a managed and compliant device, right? And that will reduce your risk on that as well. There's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of equations, there's a lot, lot, of, lot of factors to consider in the equation, and depending on your organization, you know, what the, you know, what are realistic, you know, controls that you can put in place. When we're talking to people that have large manufacturing floors, or large supply centers and things like that, and the users don't actually even use computers, right? They just have this little smart pad device. Well, how do I enable them to change their password? How do I do this? You know, there's a lot of different processes to keep in mind.
So I can't give you a great answer. I'm sorry. Anybody else? Oh, you, you talked about the some of the logs and where you could find those. Um, uh -huh. With the, some of the searches you're doing and things like that, can those show up in the risky users eventually? Are you going to implement that or anything like that? Okay, so great question. And, okay, statement number one is we actually have an ongoing dialogue with the product engineering team that says, um, you know, we have logs, logs, logs. We have different pieces of data depending on which part of the product you're looking at, and that's a really crappy customer experience. Fix it. Harmonize them. And we're really trying to make sure that they don't rip out <laughs> the pieces that we find valuable so it's nobody has them anywhere. Um, but we're giving those kind of requirements to the product team. They're really receptive to it. It takes them a little bit of time. Um, are there risk events which tend to fire, right, risky sign-in events, when we see the abuse of this feature or compromise of this feature? The answer is yes. I mean, in general, you're going to see unfamiliar location or unfamiliar properties. If you still have impossible travel, sometimes that one will fire. We don't have a specific one yet based on this kind of research. We are working in collaboration with the team you know, that builds that part of the product to see if they can incorporate one. So the answer is we're trying. But we'd rather get information out to our customers to better protect yourselves than rely on that dev, dev cycle. Um, there's quite a bit of work around um, you know, token anomalies and things like that. So if all of a sudden, you know, one of the things we are seeing, particularly in the golden SAML attack scenario, where all of a sudden, <laughs> um, Threat actors, including a claim that you're inside the corporate network, but your ADFS environment is not configured to, um, to ever issue that claim, it'll actually say, hey, wait, there's, there's something weird with this token, right? So you get an anomalous token alert. Um, by design, the anomalous token alerts will have a high false positive rate, okay? We wanted to err on that side but they are worth looking at. 2020 hindsight, when I'm seeing, you know, stolen session cookies off, or stolen cookies off of an endpoint, so cookie theft, when I'm seeing session hijacking, when I'm seeing adversary in the middle, I can almost always find a risk event that fired for it, but to be honest, the signal noise ratio on those risk events can be pretty bad. It's a good 2020 hindsight right now, but the ones that show high risk are usually really good. But we are working with the team that does detections to feed this input into them and see if they can incorporate this into one of their concrete uh, risk detections. Great question. Thank you. Yes, sir. So um, I'm going to re, you know, repeat the question so everybody in the recording or in the virtual world can hear it, which was if we have a risk event associated with one of these authentications and you are using the identity, either the built-in um, identity protection rules, or you can implement the much more finer grain ones based on, uh, on sign-in risk or session or user risk um, within conditional access policies. If you have one of those policies set that would say, hey, if it's a risky sign-in event, require additional proof up, right? Require you to re-authenticate, require you to change credentials. Would that also break, you know, basically slow down the threat actor in effectively using this technique? Um, probably. The reason I say probably is they are impersonating a legitimate user. So they can still present a new token, right, that says, yeah, I really am this guy. Um, <laughs> but it's still going to have anomalous properties. So there are scenarios where it depends on what remediation you require. If you require the user to reset the password, yeah, that's, that's going to break the back of it, right? If you require the user to do MFA, 
that's going to break the back of it. If you just require them to sign in again, it's not going to. Great questions, and I think we're out of time, but Thomas and here and I are here the rest of the day, so thank you so very much, folks. Thank you.